Hi, I'm Susan Butterworth from Intergame Magazine. Welcome to our episode on mini golf, where we'll be looking at the impact COVID-19 has had on different venues. Today, I'm joined by Richard Gottfried, marketing consultant and mini golf enthusiast, Simon Tompkins, general manager of Hastings Adventure Golf, and Andy Johnson, who heads up golfing operations for the Hollywood Bowl Group and its newly launched Putt Stars brand. Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining me. Hello. Hi. Clearly, COVID-19 has had a massive impact on the leisure sector. Simon, as someone who manages an outdoor seaside location with three mini golf courses, how have the regulations impacted the running of your business? And are there any positive lessons to be taken from this experience? Hi, Susan. Hi, everyone. Um, yes, as I'm sure everyone's well aware, um, COVID's had a massive impact on our sector, especially Hastings as a sort of tourist town down there right on the seafront. But it's been a real struggle. We we shut down um, along with everyone else on the sort of 21st of March and we didn't reopen the site again until the start of June. So we sort of lost a big chunk of what would have been valuable trading for us. Um, all of Easter went, the bank holidays all went and typically the weather would have been fantastic. So it would have been great for us. So it's had a massive impact on our business. In terms of since we reopened, uh, there's been a lot of changes we've had to implement on the site like everyone else in the world now. So social distancing plays a massive factor in that. But just taking a step back before that, we took the view of making sure all of our staff were safe and happy. Because at the end of the day, without our staff, I'm sure Andy and Richard would agree, we didn't have a business, uh, we wouldn't be able to run. So we implemented polycarbonate screens. We implemented a pod system, which I'll come back to in a minute. And all these different things to make sure that our staff, first and foremost, felt safe while at work. Then we then took the next step, obviously, is the backbone of our business, our customers, and ensuring that everything else was in place from them. It was very key for us to make sure that public perception was key. We were right on the seafront, so even if you're not playing on our site, you're still walking past and you're still seeing what's going on. So with social media so prevalent at the moment, it's very easy for someone just to take a snapshot of what could be a bad two-second moment, but it could spread. So we've had to make sure that we have put queuing systems in place. We have put extra hours out on uh, our staffing to make sure that each course individually is managed so social distancing is maintained because I'm sure Richard and Andy will agree different holes have different layouts. So there's different areas sometimes between the greens. So on one hole, it may look like there's a lot of space, but then we get a slightly tighter bend and all of a sudden you've got four people stood in there. It doesn't look right. So we have now have people actively managing the courses, which we never had before. Um, queuing systems, our balls and clubs are sanitised after every single use. So we're doing that once again out in front of the public where they can see that we're doing it. We're not sort of whistling out clubs away and thinking, yes, we are cleaning it. We're doing it right in front so people are feeling safe. And what we're noticing more is we're getting a lot more returning staff, a lot more returning players, sorry. We think that's down to them feeling safe and knowing that they can come to our venue because everything's been done to the best of our ability. Simon, tell us a little bit about the pod system that you've put in place and whether it's been difficult to get staff and customers behind some of these changes. Okay, so firstly, the, the pod system then. We, we're not only on our site, we have three mini golf courses. We also have other catering outlets, fish and chips, ice creams, kiosk, street food. So it's quite an expansive site and we have up to sort of 70 members of staff, including seasonal, on the one site. So this whole process has been a little bit more thinking outside the box. So person A isn't coming in and just working their normal nine to five shift. They may have to come in and work a longer shift. So we could, we've tried to avoid people having crossovers. So in our business, let's take just the golf, for example, we've set up what we call pods or bubbles, as everyone else seems to call them in the, up and down the country. So we've made sure that pod A, for example, will only ever work with the same people in pod A. And let's say they work on a Monday, but they will cover the entirety of Monday. And Tuesday, for example, would then be pod B, and they would cover the entirety of of a Tuesday. Reason being that if someone in pod A had contracted COVID, or still could obviously now, um, it would only take out that pod, so therefore effectively half of that part of the business. If we'd allowed everyone just to cross over and carry on like that, we would potentially have to shut down, let's say, the golf side of our business because everyone there would have been track and traced and told to isolate. So we've set that up. That proved very challenging because it's very difficult to tell staff how to change their working life. Everyone's, everyone's agreed and a lot of our staff are furloughed, so everyone enjoys that. 
So the, there was the sort of initial bringing him staff back after furlough, sort of mentally when they've all sat at home for two and a half, some of them three months, not doing anything and getting 80% of their money. But, oh, brilliant. Now you want me to come back and work and you want me to work 12-hour shifts as opposed to I normally only work six-hour shifts. So that took a little while for them to get used to. Um, but so far it's worked well. And in truth, coming back to some of the things that we've implemented, we will look at carrying on running further forward. Um, and our pod systems may be something because the staff have had longer days, but they've enjoyed having more time off, especially this time of year when staff are normally working flat out, working five, six days a week, some of them just to get their hours in when we're busier. They're now working three or four longer days and enjoying more free time for themselves. So once again, that's something that was almost forced upon us to ensure our business was sustainable and could run in every eventuality, but something that we may look at continuing moving forward through the winter and into next year. Andy, since lockdown, you faced the challenge of opening three indoor venues with new staff. How's that worked out? Yeah, it, it's been challenging. Um, I mean, we opened one just before we went into lockdown. So our first site in Leeds, we opened and traded for 12 days and then went into lockdown. And then obviously subsequently coming back, opened two sites in Rochdale and York um, and having to open those limited amount of training that we could do for the team normally we would try and buddy all of our team members up with somebody else for at least a minimum of two weeks and um, so they got real exposure to to our business and how it works and what was expected of them obviously we just we couldn't do that and um, the current restrictions and um, so then yeah and, and not just opening up and having a lack of training but in a very different environment to what people have been used to and um, similar to um, to what Simon was just saying there, we obviously we've got screens in place and we really look to think about how do we make it safe for our team and our customers, but equally, how do we ensure that we still maintain the fun element to the experience? We didn't want customers to come into our our venues and, and feel like they were just being um, sort of herded from one space to another in, in a bubble and oh, you can't do this and you can't do that. And we were really conscious about, about trying to achieve that. So yeah, it's been, it has been a challenge, um, ensuring that our team understand what's expected of them and, and that they can deliver that. But I feel that um, we've done a, I think we've done a very good job in our sort of opening 10 days of trade that I've had in, in, in York and Rochdale um, over the, the recent week and a half has been phenomenal, to be honest, and, and sort of surpassed my expectations. So the demand is definitely there. Um, and customers are really, really wanting to get out and enjoy fun experiences with friends and families, which is great to see. Um, but from an operational perspective, we've just had to, yeah, um, kind of look at it from a slightly different slant and, and put those restrictions in place on capacity. And the same as what Simon was saying with regards to making sure our customers are seeing that we are sort of cleaning down the balls, cleaning down the, the touch screens that we have for our scoring, cleaning down the clubs uh, at every given opportunity, really. Um, the government didn't help um, the last week with throwing the kind of face masks um, issue into the mix as well, sort of a late addition. I think people had got used to the idea that if they were going somewhere to eat food and drink, they didn't have to wear a face mask. So coming into our venue where we serve food and drink, the, the kind of thought process for most customers was, well, I don't need to wear a face mask because they're serving food and drink. Whereas in reality, um, it is now mandatory for people to wear face masks in our environment. So that was a, a sort of added complexity, which was a bit of a, a late call really and, and did add, add an extra challenge. And we're, we're, to be honest, we're finding that dependent upon location, some locations, people are much more compliant than they are in others. Um, and obviously for us, um, we, we can't physically police that. We have to make the su suggestion that people should be wearing face masks and we've got signs up and our team members are telling people when they're coming into our venues that that's what they should be doing. But it's, you know, it's not, we can't enforce that once they're in the centre, which then opens up other issues where some customers are asking us, well, why aren't they wearing a face mask? And I am, and all of those different questions. And it is, it is very, very challenging. But equally, um, yeah, it's been, it's still been great fun um, for us getting those new centres open. And as I said, the numbers and the way we've traded have, have been excellent. So really, really pleased with our opening trade. And Richard, as someone who's been to most of the mini golf courses in the UK, has COVID-19 put you off at all? Um, I wouldn't say it's put me off. Um, I'm, I'd say I'm paused. I've been paused for the last 
five or six months in places to go and uh, places to play. Um, but yeah, for the first 20 days of 2020, I visited 20 courses. Um, and then since lockdown in March, I visited seven courses. Um, so normally my wife, Emily and I, we're, we're out, you know, a couple, of t- a couple of evenings a week and at weekends as well. And we're out there playing courses. Um, but what we have been doing during the, the lockdown period is, you know, building up our bucket list of places to play when we're able to get out and travel a bit further afield, get back out to seasides. Um, and the great thing is, you know, there are still new courses opening. So obviously Putt Stars um, have opened their, their sites. We haven't yet um, played the Putt Stars courses. We haven't been back down to Hastings. Um, you know, that's on our list of places to revisit when we can do. But, you know, there's so many courses opening up all around the, the country. Um, I mean, the, the thing that, that we're looking at and when we have played is we want peace of mind. You know, you want to feel safe and secure. Um, and when we have been out to play, we did play at an indoor adventure golf course, Gator Golf in, uh, in Chorley in Lancashire. Um, and we found, you know, that process was, it was so smooth. Um, and as Andy said, you don't want to take the fun away from things. You don't want to make the experience sterile. You want it to be sterile from a hygienic point of view, but from a player's point of view, from a customer's point of view, you want still to have fun. You don't want to have lots and lots of additional rules to take away from the fun of playing mini golf. Um, and we found the experience, you know, it was, it was simple. It was straightforward. There was no real added time. There was no queuing. Uh, we, you know, gave our details for track and trace while one member of staff was taking our details. Another member of staff was um, actually cleaning the putters balls, the pencil and getting the scorecard ready in another part of the, the venue we could see that taking place as Simon and Andy have said you know the cleaning down of, of the equipment in front of the customer so that was done and then we got on the course we played a game I won so I was really happy we scored a lot of holes in one um, and got to experience a course that we hadn't been to before um, and yeah just 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 enjoyed it and, and I think that's the, the key thing mini golf is a fun game and you want it to be fun even with, you know, limitations that there may have to be for the time being. Andy, um, I know that you've worked hard to bring something new to the world of mini golf. Can you tell us a little bit about how Put Stars has tweaked the mini golf experience? Yeah, um, obviously when we set out with our projects, we kind of wanted to, to try and do something a little bit different. So I spent a lot of time, I think there's just over 700 indoor and outdoor mini golf courses across the UK. And over the last year or so, it feels like I've played a lot of those. Um, I'm sure I'm not as good as Richard, but um, but I certainly enjoyed my time playing. But one of the overarching things that, that, that I felt when I was playing a lot of those courses was that the the theme over was quite similar uh, a lot of the time and we wanted to try and do something a little bit different. So we spent a lot of time and, and a lot of effort and, and a lot of money um, on trying to make our holes with intrigue and interest on every hole. So there's something a bit different about every hole that you play um, where it's not just um, some sort of sloping felt around some rocks or something. We wanted to try and change it up a little bit. So we do have, you know, we have Ferris wheels, we have a roulette wheel, um, we have a loop de loop and all of those kind of things within, within our holes, which we think that it just kind of makes it that bit more intriguing and interesting as you go around and you play. And we've got the different colored felt so we'll have red and green and blue and and, and white felt and, and and grass and artificial grass on on the courses as well so um so yeah and that added up with uh, using technology so we we wanted to kind of remove the pencil and paper if if you like and get we kind of when you go around and having to dig that pencil out and having to dig the paper out after you've played the hole and so we kind of thought well, how can we we can move things on and we can use technology to our advantage so we've got um, it's all digital our scoring and you play the hole and then you put your number of shots that you've played into the tablet on the following hole and that converts it into points for you we've also added jokers in so you could double the number of points that you then get on your on your next hole um, and then we have leaderboards around the courses or around the, around the center sorry where the scores are displayed and one thing that 
that we've really seen is that the, the kids interacting with those leaderboards and seeing their score, um, if they've beaten their mum or their dad and they're celebrating is, is something that's great to see. And we kind of get that, you know, I don't know, sometimes <clears throat> I suppose the real hardcore golf enthusiasts might think that we've maybe taken away from the traditional way of scoring and we have, um, but we really wanted to look and focus on that main family element, that family market that we know works so well for us with bowling and we kind of thought well um we don't really believe that there was somebody out there a branded multi-site operator really kind of going after that market we looked at it for you've got junkyard and and um ghetto golf at one end of the market and they're kind of looking at the 18 to 30 year olds um, and it's very wet led and then at the other end you've got paradise island and and mulligans that we we kind of feel that weren't really doing and capturing and really kind of getting the the audience for kids for parents and for young adults and we felt that by doing what we've done hopefully we've managed to kind of make ourselves available to all of those different market groups and there's something for everybody obviously we've got amusements and food and drink um, all one, under one roof as well so yeah hopefully by doing that we've kind of pulled it together and are offering something that is a little bit different from what was currently in the market. Great. And um, can you tell me a little bit about your CRM and your other marketing strategies and how maybe some of the technology interplays with the CRM? Yeah, so we've had a purpose-built booking system, um, which we built from scratch. Um, we took a lot of the learnings that we've got from our bowling business, and we understand that data is king for us. Um, it helps us to gain a lot of traction with our customers and understand when our customers play and how often they visit and when they visit. And the more information we can gather about our customers enables us to target them more specifically particularly packages that might be relevant to them for their birthday or for another celebration that they might be having. So everybody that books with us online, we capture their data. Everybody that comes and walks into the center, we will ask them for their email address. Um, so obviously the more data we capture, the, the, the better we are placed as a business to be able to kind of turn the dial. And something that we've seen in bowling is when the weather is hot, it's very, very difficult for us to attract customers to, to walk into our business. But when we've got that data, we can send a, a, an e comms out to all of those people in our database with a real targeted offer. Um, and we've got some real good traction from those offers. And they can be a sort of a game changer from us on a hot, sunny day in the middle of summer, where I'm sure Simon will be very busy. Uh, but we definitely aren't. You know, we're, we're really reverse. We want it to be wet um, and miserable. Um, and luckily in the UK, it's like that a lot of the time, um, which benefits us. And having that data and that ability to turn it on and off and, and, and put those offers out there at a time that, uh, that are best suited for us and our customers and yeah it really does uh, play a big part for our business and um, on top of that uh, we do a lot of social um, sort of digital marketing and um, we have you know we spend a lot of money on, on social elements on, on, on getting the right people in the right areas and using the right channels um, to communicate with the different types of market that we have and um, we have different packages that we can then sort of push towards those different markets, whether it be a family biz, family market that we're looking for, or it's young adults, or whether it's corporates that we're looking for, and um, different packages that we can then tailor to suit those different people and different channels of marketing, um, whether it be billboards that we do, and um, whether it be radio that we'll sometimes do, or whether it just be sort of online quantcasts, uh, all of those different things, really. We don't believe that We've just got one channel. We, we kind of look at lots of different channels and we do multi-channel marketing to, to kind of get the overall picture and, and wrap up as many people as we can, really. Richard, um, as a marketing expert and someone who's probably on the mailing list of many uh, mini golf con courses in the country, what kind of promotions are you seeing at the moment and which are most likely to get you heading out to a mini golf course? Yeah, um, yeah, my inbox is uh, is full, full to the brim with uh, offers and deals. Um, it's been interesting actually over the last few months to see the the, the change. So you know, when lockdown hit, a number of um, courses that I hadn't heard of or heard of from for for quite a while, um, you know, came out with their their you know information. We are closed. We'll be back open as soon as possible. Um, but then some of those courses have actually been really good and have kept in touch on a regular basis. Um, others I've heard nothing else since. Um, so 
you know, some courses have really upped their game and not only in newsletters, but you know, as Andy was saying as well there, um, and the stuff I'm seeing from, from Hastings, you know, the, the organic um, social media activity. So when I log on to Facebook or Twitter, I'm seeing activity. During the lockdown as well, I was seeing a number of courses doing putting at home activities, you know, isolation, mini golf challenges and competitions to keep customers you know, keep crazy golf and mini golf and adventure golf in, in the minds of, of their customers. Um, and then since lockdown has eased, um, a number of courses, you know, have been sending out regular um, emails. So, um, you know, ones that spring to mind, I'd say teasers in Coventry um, and caddies in South End on Sea. Um, so that's a course I haven't yet visited. It, it opened just after I last was down visiting family in, in South End. But it's another one, you know, it's, it's keeping themselves and their name and their brand name and you know the idea of just playing mini golf and getting out and, and doing an accessible family friendly fun activity um you know being social but being socially somewhere we can be socially distant as well um it's keeping it you know top of top of the agenda because you know there are lots and lots of different activities you can do um again the competition for um you know, whether it's families or whether it's young adults or whether it's the older market and the corporate market, you know, there, there are the, the competing things. You've got the traditional temp in bowling, you've got mini golf, you've got shuffleboard, you've got darts, um, arcade clubs as well. So, um, you know, you do really need to, to be targeted with your marketing, but also have a, an element of your marketing activity just to keep your name out there and, you know, raise the profile of mini golf and, and all of the different types of, of mini golf that are available to play um so yeah there's, there's been a few out there that have piqued my interest um i think one of the things that's been interesting is seeing um those courses um that are you know advertising when they're quieter because obviously there is a, a sort of a fear element from some people in if they're coming out of shielding so not everybody has been able to be out and about all the time during the pandemic um, some people, some of my friends and family are still shielding now. So, you know, they're looking for the future. They're looking to next year when they can get out and about as well. So it's, it's not forgetting that there are, you know, people out there who want to be out and about, but still need to be entertained and have those offers for them when people are ready to, to go out and about. So some of the good offers, you know, when people are promoting their quieter times, so like Andy and Simon said, using the data, whether it's through um, apps and loyalty schemes as well, they're able to see when, you know, when's a quieter time so we can put out an offer there. Um, it might be early mornings. It might be on, you know, Thursday evenings. That's what I found with the course in Chorley. So, you know, eat out to help out has meant, you know, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesdays, places are really busy, but on Thursdays and Fridays, not so busy. Um, so it's interesting to see the, the real mixture of, of marketing and messages that are out there. Simon, um, Hastings Adventure Golf's been in operation since 1974, so it must be doing something right to have weathered the economic storms of the last 40 years or so. We've just been told we're vented into the worst recession on record. What's the key to weathering the storm? Um, I will. I wish I knew the key. I would have bottled it and sold it. Plus, trust me. But in truth, I feel I think we've all touched on it there a little bit. Crazy golf for me. To everyone but we've done a lot of advertising targeted i don't know if andy's thought the same but we kind of in our mind have anyone from two to 102 can play this game so yes as richard touched on you can target different evenings and andy said about the families and stuff but we've found we got a lot of advertising last year went on sky television to sort of promote it that way but we didn't know exactly where to target because it, we appeal to everyone so it's very challenging what has helped us, though, back in the sort of 2008 period was the staycation, which I think is going to be quite prevalent in this next period moving forward. And also the fact that everyone's very keen on doing things, as Richard just touched on, and families and groups and now meeting up with people. So we're hopeful that will carry us through this next period um, <clears throat> because mini golf is a game that everyone can enjoy at the same time. There's a lot of other activities. Let's take, say, the, the climbing activities or other things, go boating. But quite often we find the parents have to sit and watch the children do the activity. Whereas the mini golf kind of appeals to everyone. Everyone can join in. Everyone can have fun. Parents can play adults. Um, parents can play children. Children can beat the adults. 
So it kind of adds to that whole family dynamic or it's a place to meet up probably more so like bowling used to be and probably still is now, Andy will tell you, I'm not sure, but it was a, it's an event that everyone can do. Um, in terms of us ourselves, we've looked at our sites and back in 2008, we thought, okay, we're going to attract X amount of people, the same as any other business. What can we do to increase their spend per head? Because Andy's touched on, they've obviously got the food and drink, et cetera. So in the period since sort of 2008, we've developed our site to make sure we include that. So we can ensure that we don't just get X amount of money for a round of mini golf. They're then staying and having the fish and chips. They're staying and having the drink. And we have then incorporated different offers within that. I think similar to what Park Stars do, you can play multiple courses for cheaper. So once again, once you've hooked in that person, if you get them to your site for the day or they're staying locally, then you'll try and get them back. So just increasing the spend per head, we found, helped us massively. Um, the other key, key thing that we've worked on hugely is our customer service. I know it's very easy for everyone to say this. And I know Andy touched on how much training they couldn't do with a budding up system. But we brought in an outside company to work with us and really push the quality of our customer service across the whole, the whole site. Um, <clears throat> where we are in Hastings, we're not competing directly with anyone for mini golf, but obviously we are competing directly with our ice cream, our fish and chips and everything from candy floss, et cetera. So we've worked really hard on paying mystery shoppers to come in and ensure that we are the best and coming back to the social media. As Rich has touched on, everyone's pushing out on that. We need to make sure that all our comments, et cetera, coming back are, are strong on what we're doing, not just COVID-wise, but also just generally across the board. Staff are lovely, staff are helpful, because that's what sticks in your mind in truth, I don't think you remember what you paid, but you remember if it's a grumpy person that served you or if a really nice person that welcomed you to the course and cleaned everything in front of you, you'll remember that person as opposed to your bank balance. Richard, um, as a very keen mini golfer, do you think that uh, mini golf will survive in what is undoubtedly going to be a tough economic and social climate? Short answer, yes. Uh, long answer, yeah, it's... Uh, it's something that's, you know, it's an enduring game. It's, as, as we've all mentioned, it's something that anyone can play from two to 102. Um, I mean, I've got family cine film of me playing that we've uh, developed during uh, lockdown. And I am, they're playing on courses when I was, when I was like one, two, three years old. And some of those courses still, still exist now. Um, you know, I've still got free game passes from Hastings Adventure Golf that I won when I was seven years old. Um, so... The, the game has been around for, for well over, you know, 100 years um, in various different forms. Um, I mean, before, uh, so up to like the start of this year, um, the game had grown from when we started playing in tw 2006, there were 600 courses. There are now well over 1,000 courses. Um, and so since May, um, there's around 45 new courses that have either opened that are in planning um, or are under construction at the moment. So even coming, having during the pandemic and coming out of the, the, the lockdown period, courses are opening, people are happy to, to go out and they do want to go out and, and have fun and do an activity that's accessible, that's safe, um, but that's also fun. And I think the, the fact is that why mini golf is so enduring, it, it, it taps into, you know, that retro and nostalgia feeling. Everyone has played it at some point, whether it's in their local town park or whether it's on holiday or a seaside. You know, the, pretty much everyone in the UK knows what mini golf is in one shape or another. Um, and with new courses, so with Putt Stars bringing out their new range of, you know, digitally enabled crazy golf, that's something new. Hastings, with their sites, they've got the traditional... Arnold Palmer crazy golf course, which is my favorite type of course, but they've also got a new adventure golf course, a pirate course with, you know, um, lots of theming, lots of, um, you know, the pirate ships firing the cannons as well. So it's got a wow factor. So you've got so many different elements to the game and it appeals to, it's a multi-generational thing. You're appealing to, you know, the traditionalist, um, someone who's played the game maybe for 30, 40, 50, 60 years, um, but then you've got, um, you know, tech savvy audience who are looking for something extra beyond the pen and paper. Um, and then you've got, you know, groups in between that are looking for that competitive socialising element as well. So 
as Andy mentioned, you know, some of the courses, Junkyard Golf, Ghetto Golf and, and others, uh, appealing to that, you know, the, the street food and, the, you know, the alcohol 18 plus audience. And there really is something for everyone. And I think mini golf is a good, it's a good vehicle for fun. It's a good way for people to get out. And, and in the future, you know, we're going to want to get back together with groups of friends, groups of family and do something that's an accessible activity. Um, and I can't think of many more accessible activities than mini golf. So I think, you know, I've got my fingers firmly crossed that there's still going to be a lot of courses out there for, for, for us to get out and play on in the future. Well, it's been great to get an insight from one of the longer established mini golf courses in the UK and one of the newest entrants to the market. Thank you, Simon and Andy, for joining me. Thanks also, Richard, for providing us with a consumer and a marketing perspective. We hope you enjoyed the discussion and thanks for watching.